Well, good morning. Well, my name is David. I'm the liturgist here, and it's my privilege to be delivering the message this morning. Uh, and in preparing, I realized it's been my privilege to preach here at St. Andrews for over five years now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know where the time is going. Uh, it's going somewhere. Uh, and you, as you would expect, at some point during this amount of time, uh, I have finally reached a story in the Bible that I have preached on before. Uh, as we head into John chapter 12, we have the moment of the triumphant entry. Uh, and I have been honored to deliver a sermon on Palm Sunday, which this uh, story is the, uh, you know, traditional story to preach on for Palm Sunday. Uh, and when I preached on it, I think I preached on fairly traditional themes of Jesus establishing his kingship, of establishing the kingdom, the way the world is transformed when that happens. So because I have done that, and it's on YouTube, uh, I feel like I have a little bit of freedom to focus on something very specific within this text today. Uh, and I will reveal that in a moment, but first let's read the text. Uh, so this is John chapter 12, starting verse 12. If you have a Bible, you can open up or you can follow on the screen. So uh, we've been following Jesus. Uh, this is just following the story of him raising Lazarus. Uh, being in Bethany with Lazarus and his sisters, and now he's making the short trip from Bethany into Jerusalem, and this is what happens. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So again, we have this wonderful message about Jesus arriving as king, the establishing of the kingdom of heaven. And as I've said, you've probably heard that sermon before on a Palm Sunday. And what I want to do is focus on a very specific figure in this story, because this story happens to feature my favorite animal of all time. And my favorite animal of all time is the donkey. If you're Ever in my classroom at the high school, students often ask me why I like donkeys so much, because you'll see around the room, uh, I have a painting with a donkey in it, I have a ceramic donkey, some different donkey figurines. Part of the reason is if you ever tell anyone your favorite animal, they start getting you all these knickknacks, but there's donkeys everywhere. And they say, Mr. Pjork, why the donkey? And I say, that's a very complicated question. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why I admire donkeys. Uh, first of all, they're just very funny. They're funny looking with their ears. They make funny noises. Uh, when comparing them to a horse, which I think, oh, we're already getting pictures. Hold on, we're not ready yet. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, if you compare them to the horse, which is often a much more popular choice of favorite animal, I just think they're a little bit more of an interesting choice. They're a little stranger, a little more silly, but they have a certain nobility to them, the donkey. Uh, they're very stubborn, but it, I find it to be kind of a stubbornness that's admiringly rebellious in a way that gives them an, an allure of dignity, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Mark Twain once wrote this, 
I believe I would rather ride a donkey than any beast in the world. He goes briskly. He puts on no airs. He is docile, though opinionated. Satan himself could not scare him. And he is convenient, very convenient. When you're tired riding, you can rest your feet on the ground and let him gallop from under you. It's a pretty wonderful description of why donkeys are so great. And just one last feather in the cap of the donkey, and this is more relevant to church, they are one of only two animals in the entire Bible that talks. If you read in the book of Numbers, there is a talking donkey. Uh, And the other uh, talking animal, does anybody know it? Yeah, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So not only is the donkey one of two, but he's the better one. Uh, And uh, my love for the donkey existed uh, because of all these reasons, but there is a story that I'd like to get into a little bit that, don't worry, connects back to the text uh, about why I like donkeys so much. And uh, we're going to have to take this all the way back to 2012. Now, 2012 started off as a fairly rough year for me. Uh, This was my third year of teaching high school. Uh, In the first two years, uh, as a new teacher, it had been characterized largely by exhaustion and then a heightened type of anxiety caused by that exhaustion. And uh, as I was heading into my third year, I found myself with my heaviest workload I'd ever had, with the most students, uh, with the most challenging classes, and this exhaustion was just not uh, letting up. And even to make things worse, at the beginning of this year, our beloved dog died, uh, and that made us very sad, and it just, it was a rough year, all the way to the point that I actually went to my department head in my school and said, I'm not coming back next year. I said, That's, this job is just not for me. Uh, now, of course, here I am, many years later, still teaching. So uh, she was able to talk me into giving it a little bit more time. But I share that just to kind of uh, sh- show you what kind of state of mind I was in as far as the level of what you would probably call burnout that I was in. But we had one thing that we were looking forward to to work through this burnout because my wife and I had planned, once we got the summer, a trip to England. What had happened was uh, I had a good friend at the church we were going to, a young young guy that was the worship leader that was from England. I'd been talking to him about this state of burnout I was in. And he's like, you sound like you need a vacation. I go, I know. I'd love to go to Europe, uh, where you're from. He said, you know, actually, my parents... Uh, own a big house out in the English countryside, and they let people stay in their guest house for free. Uh, And we were able to line up this trip where we could go uh, to the English countryside and stay in this guest house. So we were just working, I was working to get through that year to get to that trip to England, which would be kind of our uh, our big prize for making it through. Finally got to the summer, exited out of the summer in a, with a complete empty tank because those are, tend to be the hardest times of the year because you're getting all the final grades in, everybody's just trying to get to the end. So staggered out of the school year. And then we have this trip to England, and I'm already in this heightened state of exhaustion. And we get on something that always helps with that state, which is a red-eye flight to Europe. Uh, <laughs> So we took a red-eye flight to Europe, and I'm not the type of guy that sleeps on planes. Uh, there's, it's just not going to happen. So I come, uh, I, I've reached new states of delirium by the time we touch soil uh, in England. Uh, and the first thing we decide to do is let's go rent a car. Uh, so you have me, you know, barely, uh, you know, cogent, uh, getting into a rental car in England, and I don't know if anyone here has driven in England before. There's, everybody's thinking of one thing, which is that you drive on the other side of the road, and that's a challenge. But what you might not know, if you haven't done this before, is that the steering wheel is on the other side of the car. 
So you've, I've spent decades driving in America, and you just have it as your instinct that the rest of the car is on this side of you. Uh, and all of a sudden, in England, it shifts. Uh, and so there's car on this side of you. And so we get out of that rental car lot, and as soon as we start going, my wife, who's on this side of me, starts uh, saying, you're driving too close to these cars. And I kind of know where I am on the road, and... I know what I'm doing. Uh, so I go, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then within 20 minutes of getting that rental car, I have smashed off somebody's side view mirror. Uh, and I, I, we pulled over. It's important that you know that we pulled over. And this, the guy whose car it was came out, and he, what a wonderful guy. <laughs> he was actually very, uh, very uh, kind and understanding. And we set up... Uh, a time where we could find out how much we owed him, but in the meantime, we didn't know how much that would be. What was this guy going to ask for us, from us? And of course, I didn't get insurance on that rental car, uh, so I didn't know. We had a, a, a smashed side view mirror and scuffs on a side, part of the side of the car, and you never know with a rental car if they're going to say, well, that's $5,000 right there. So remember, I'm already exhausted from the year, red-eye flight, and now I have this anxiety on me of uh, what's going to happen with this car, and that's all perfect for when the uh, aspects of jet lag hit me, uh, which if any of you have done international travel, you know that by itself is enough to drive you crazy. We try to go to sleep that night to rest from the trip. We find that we can't. And so by the second day of that trip, I was what you would call a nervous wreck. Everything hit me like a wall. Uh, the culmination of those years of stress and exhaustion, all of this, these elements of this trip found me, and I was kind of just a shambling wreck. And I remember this moment because my wife and I, at that time, took a walk out of our guest house, and this guest house was on the side of what you call common land. These are English commons, which is acres and acres of grassland that different people's livestock would just roam freely. You could walk out there and you would see, you could see just a herd of cows or some horses. Uh, there was a really scary pig that chased Sandy. Uh, and uh, I remember walking there and I just, I just didn't have anything left. And then all of a sudden, we were standing there, and this little pack of donkeys comes up to us. And I don't know if you've ever interacted with donkeys, and it's pretty true to my experience that they are just the sweetest animals. And they just came up to us and kind of let us pet them and feed them little grass. Okay, now we have the picture of Sandy with one of the donkeys. And for some reason, when they entered into that scene with us, I just felt this presence of peace. And as I pet the little donkey, I started to cry. And I felt all of that built-up, pent-up anxiety just start to melt and start to fall off of me in the presence of these donkeys. And it was at that point, as I'm petting the donkey, that I noticed, and I don't know if many of you know this, that on the back of many donkeys is the image of the cross. And so I'm sitting there with these donkeys looking down at this cross. I have a picture, too. Uh, nobody knows why donkeys have crosses on their backs, uh, if it's some kind of camouflage or what, but it seems pretty coincidental to me that this creature that has a cross on its back is the same animal that bore Jesus into Jerusalem as he was nearing his time on the cross. And I share this story with you because at that time in my life, these donkeys came, it, what I believe, 
honestly, as ambassadors of God's peace to me in a climactic time of anxiety. I needed some sort of delivery system of God's presence, and it happened to be on the backs of these little English donkeys. And you know what? That works for this text, because we get this moment of Jesus' triumphal entry as the Prince of Peace in a time of turmoil. If you look at how it's situated in the text, this moment, this wonderful moment of celebration, where it seems like the people finally get it, here is the true king, it's nestled between two major moments of anxiety for Jesus. Directly before this story, we have this moment with Mary of Bethany, and when she's anointing his feet with this precious oil, his comment is that this oil was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And we have this moment where Jesus is thinking about his coming death. And we know that this was something that caused Jesus great inner turmoil and distress. Because after the story of his triumphal entry, he's talking again to his disciples, and he again tells them that his death is coming, and he even describes in John 12, 27, how his soul is troubled. So Jesus himself has these moments of anxiety, but right in the middle is that moment of celebration and peace, almost ministering to him in this time where he's coming up to the greatest challenge of his life. And I think it's a moment of peace. And I think it's not only a moment of peace for Jesus, but it's a declaration of peace from the Prince of Peace. And this comes back again to the donkey, because Jesus' choice to ride that donkey was a statement. First of all, it was a statement that he was fulfilling this prophecy from Zechariah about the coming Messiah. From Zechariah 9.9, this is the verse that John quotes in this story. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Your king comes to you on a donkey. Why a donkey? Well, almost all the commentaries have about the same thing to say about it as I was reading through them. And I'll read to you from Leon Morris, the theologian, and he writes this. The words of this prophecy point to a distinctive mark of Christ's kingship. The donkey was not normally used by a warlike person. It was the animal of a man of peace, a priest, a merchant, or the like, a conqueror, would ride into the city on a war horse, or perhaps march in on foot at the head of his troops. The donkey speaks of peace. John sees accordingly not only a fulfillment of prophecy, but such a fulfillment of prophecy as indicates a special kind of king. As Mark said at the beginning of the service, a lot of people in Jerusalem that were awaiting a Messiah might have been awaiting something very different, maybe a political leader or someone that could throw off the shackles of Rome. But instead what they get is somebody that instead of a warrior is an ambassador of peace. And I think this is helpful for us to know. I mean, number one, we look and pray to the Prince of Peace in our world today as we see throughout the world the outbreak of war, the fear that comes along with that, and even the conflict within our own country between citizens who seem like they're ready to go to war. What we need is the sovereign power of the Prince of Peace. But we also need it in our lives like I needed it at that time in England 
when so much of the anxiety of life was on me, we need to know that Jesus' presence comes when we need it. And I think that that's what this text is saying, that when we are at the pinnacle of pressure, when everything is building up, we're at the apex of anxiety, Jesus comes into our lives as the Prince of Peace. That that's a promise he makes to us. It's a promise he makes to his disciples in just a couple chapters later when they're realizing that Jesus is going to leave them and they are in that moment of anxiety. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And this is a promise that he leaves with us in our lives. That when we are in those moments of worry, pain, and anxiety, we have a Savior that will bring the peace that passes understanding into our lives. This is what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 4 when he told people, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. And so, as we end today, I want to pray that that reality of God's providential peace would come into your lives, would tend to your hearts and your minds, wherever you're at, so that when you're in that moment of pressure, when you're in that moment of anxiety, you can depend on the Prince of Peace to enter your life with the power of his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you come into our lives with your mercy. And in our times of worry, in our times of anxiety, you deliver that peace that transcends all understanding. And so I pray now for anyone in this room that's in that moment of anxiety, it's in that moment of worry that your Holy Spirit would descend on them and would bring that peace of your heart and your presence into their lives. We thank you. We thank you that you have established your kingdom and that your kingdom is a kingdom of peace and mercy. We thank you for your love. 